Well, good afternoon and welcome to Deep in Scripture. This is Marcus Grodi, your host, joined as, as usual by Dr. Kenneth Howell. And we're coming to you from the Coming Home Network International. And uh, we're, we're reflecting on the book of Romans. And we're picking up right in the middle of Romans. If, you, if you're joining us for the first time, you can go to our website, chnetwork.org org or deepinscripture.com, either one, and, and uh, listen to the previous programs. Our goal was to slowly work through Romans and, uh, and glean from it uh, what, our, uh, what the Apostle Paul was uh, trying to teach us about uh, walking with Christ, walking together in obedience to Christ, and receiving new life uh, from Christ because of what our Lord has done for us on the cross. And we find ourselves in the section today, we're going to look at a long section. Uh, we'll see uh, whether we get through the whole section or not. Beginning with verse 9 of chapter 3 and verse all the way through verse 31. And uh, Ken, before we get to that whole long section though, uh, we, we always try to take an email if we can. So, Ken, I'm going to do the easy part. I'm going to read the email, then pass it over to you. How about that? <laughs> okay, sounds good. <laughs> I mean, we'll look at it together. And again, we, any listener, we would love to hear from you. Uh, this comes from Gene, and he writes, Last week, in your interpretations of Romans 2.29, you replace Christian for Jew, the term Christian for the term Jew, as an application. Instead of what Paul wrote... Uh, he wrote, For he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and real circumcision is a matter of the heart, spiritual and not literal. You read, quote, For he is a Christian who is one inwardly, and real baptism is a matter of the heart, spiritual and not literal, unquote. And Gene writes, If this is an accurate application, in other words, replacing circumcision with baptism, then doesn't this imply that the sacrament of baptism, like circumcision, is merely a matter of the heart and faith with no kind of literal sacramental effect, that it is merely symbolic? And he writes, thanks, Gene. Ken, does, <clears throat> first of all, does the does the replacement of baptism for circumcision, is that an accurate application? Because we theologically talk about baptism now being the Christian uh, entrance into the body as, as circumcision was. And if that's the case, is Gene's argument correct in that therefore wouldn't that mean that baptism is nothing more than a spiritual symbolic repre representation of an act of faith? I think I think the substitution of baptism for circumcision in the new covenant dispensation is accurate, and it's not just acknowledged by Catholics, but it's acknowledged by Lutherans and by by um, uh, Reformed or Calvinists, uh, and certainly I believed that when I was a Calvinist, uh, and it's based upon uh, several passages, but one of the most important is in the book of Colossians chapter two where Paul says that you were circumcised with the circumcision not with not made with hands by in the removal of the flesh of the body but in the circumcision of Christ having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised through faith in the power of God who works effectively and who raised him from the dead in other words what Paul is saying in Colossians here he seems to be equating the circumcision of Christ and baptism. So that baptism is the new circums form of circumcision. Now, the question then that Gene is asking is uh, extremely perceptive and, and good. And it, it's a question that I asked myself as I studied this text. Now, we have to remember what Paul is arguing against here, right? He's arguing against the Jew trying to claim superiority or um, somehow being in a better position before God be, than the Gentile because they have law, because they have circumcision. And we know from the book of Galatians and others that this was a deep problem in the early church because 
the the first people to become Christians or to become Messianic people were the Jews, right? And so they tried to say, well, if you to the Gentiles, well, if you want to be a true follower of Jesus Christ, you have to be circumcised first, and then you can become a follower. And this, of course, is the um, you might say the land the um, the big. Uh, uh, challenge of the gospel is Paul, Paul says, no, that's not necessary because uh, the Gentiles are ex- received by faith just as Abraham was. Now, that's one side. That's the tendency toward legalism, right? The, the idea that if I just go through these motions, uh, that I will be acceptable to God. If I'm a Jew, if I'm circumcised, Everything about I mean, or in the modern application, if I'm just baptized in the Catholic Church, everything's okay. Right? The other one, though, however, is to deny the the value and validity of circumcision or in the New Covenant baptism. If you weren't circumcised as a Hebrew, you were rejecting the law of God. You were rejecting the uh, custom that God had given to Abraham. In Genesis 17, where he says, circumcise your firstborn. So circumcision was not an option. It was necessary. But what Paul is arguing here in in Romans chapter 2 is that the outward act had an inner meaning. And that's what made it. uh, And that inner meaning was a call to the holiness that the circumcision signified. The same is true of baptism, except the Catholic Church believes, and the Church Fathers certainly teach, that there is a difference between circumcision and baptism in this respect, that circumcision wasn't a true sacrament in the sense that it contained what it signified. Baptism, however, is a true sacrament. It contains what it signifies. It gives the grace of forgiveness. It gives the presence of the Holy Spirit. And then... What that is, is an implicit call to the baptized Christian to live up to that, to have a circumcision of the heart. And what Paul is arguing against here is the tendency to simply rest on one's spiritual laurels, as it were, and think that one is acceptable uh, to God. So when what he's also saying, which is very significant, is that if a person who's not baptized, nevertheless has an inward yearning for God, it will act as if it really were the baptism because they're being given grace to do that. It all uh, seems to emphasize that through the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus, the graces that then comes from that to us changed all these uh, sacramental acts, forms, that, yeah, yeah, forms yeah. which previously were indeed uh, symbols that pointed to God, but now they've been changed to uh, it, it truly carry the grace and the presence of Christ. We can look at marriage, for yeah, example, right. the sacrament of marriage. You know, it was changed. And so now the sacrament of marriage doesn't really just point to the fact that a husband and wife are symbolically now one person, but that they really there's been a change. Ordination involves a conferring of grace and a changing of character. Um, baptism, the baptism of John, is different now. It That's was previously exactly right. a baptism of forgiveness. Now. It truly changes, and it makes me think about uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, where he writes, Baptism, which corresponds to this, and he's referring back to the, uh, the ark, being the, the, the Noah and the, his family being saved through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a clear conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So in other words, all these things were, are different now. They're different now. They're not merely, an, baptism isn't a work of the law, a work of church law. Ordination yeah. isn't a work of church law. There's really something conveyed yeah. that is different. 
and it's the gift. And what you expressed when you talked about this all coming and flowing from the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ is exactly what St. Thomas Aquinas says in the Summa Theologica. He says that all of the graces that we receive through the sacraments flow from um, flow from the, the, the death of Christ. So if you can think of it as, you know, we can't portray it here physically but or visually for people, but if you can think of seven sacraments sort of lined out there, starting with baptism and confirmation and Eucharist and so forth, and then if you think of above it, then there's a, there's Jesus Christ on the cross. Draw a line from the cross to every sacrament, and that and that the grace that comes through that sacrament comes because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If we draw that parallel between the the Passover meal and the Eucharist especially in the upper room where they're celebrating the Passover meal. Mm -hmm. So we have the, the historic trajectory, the Passover meal, the celebration, the, the cultus of that, the worship, um, the, the rite of that. Right. And then we have the new rite of the Eucharist. And we make the parallel between it's the real body of the lamb in the Passover meal and it's the real body of our Lord and his blood in the Eucharist. There is that parallel, but there's more. Because it is real. It is the, the coming down from the cross. It is the body and blood. The graces that come through the Eucharist are different than the mere pointing of the, of the Passover meal to what happened back in Egypt. There's right. more here. It's a realness in the mystery yeah. of that. that uh, uh, so it, we can make the, the, the insertion of baptism for the word circumcision in these passages but there's more to it than that, is uh, mm -hmm. is what we're getting at. I mean, is the true conviction. In fact, the thing that I learned recently, Ken, uh, and I didn't realize this until I was doing some historical research, is that really up until the Reformation, you find the early church fathers and then the the writers of the Middle Ages, the late Middle Ages, like Thomas Aquinas. Uh, I saw this in Hilary of, of Poitiers, but that when they talked about the, the indwelling of Jesus in the believer, whereas after the Reformation we think of the indwelling of Christ in the believer comes through faith mm -hmm. as, as we accept Jesus into our heart and so he enters into our heart, that before that they saw the indwelling of Christ as coming through the sacraments, particularly the yeah. Eucharist. Yeah, and it, it's, it's the faith it plays the role of faith in God via or through the sacraments. And Paul is going to say this same thing when he talks about in chapter 6, when he asked the question at the end of chapter 5, well then, you know, if grace abounded, in chapter 5 he's, he's making the argument, then grace abounds when our sin is greater. So the natural conclusion, well, let's go on sinning because then we'll get more grace from God, right? And then in chapter 6 he says, well, how can you think that way? Because you've been baptized into the death and resurrection of Christ. That uh, we'll, we'll spend some time when we get to chapter 6 because that's a crucial passage to understand Paul's theology. That bab the, the power of baptism is that it connects us to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But at the same time, baptism is a call to live the life, to inwardly realize that which baptism means externally. You know, Ken... Uh, I, I know we need to get to the passage, but this reminds me of, you know, in all the years that I've been doing the Journey Home program and, and we hear uh, guests talk about their conversion and often they come to realize that their, what their baptism meant and what their baptism did many, many years ago and that their awakening of faith is really uh, uh, an experiencing of what the baptism had done. And it reminds me that we sometimes think that the power of the sacrament to change our life depends upon our faith. And if I don't believe, then the sacrament doesn't have any power. Whereas, in fact, the sacrament accomplishes what it accomplishes. But whether we reap the benefits of it is what's yeah, dependent upon our faith. Well, that that's the thing that's so important about understanding, especially the church fathers, and as you know, I've 
read them uh, a bit and, and translated them and so forth. And but in reading them, that's the thing I realized is that they believed in this the objective presence of God in the sacrament. But then the question was, well, then what about the benefit? And that depends upon our faith. But yeah. but the the presence of God it doesn't depend on the effectiveness. It's there. It's because it's there. All right. Thank you, Ken. Well, you're listening to Deep in Scripture with uh, Dr. Kenneth Howell and, and, uh, and myself, Marcus Grodi. We're looking at Romans chapter 3, verses 9 through 31. Uh, I'm not going to read through the whole passage uh, right now. If you want to see that, besides looking into your own scriptures, uh, you can go to the website and see the worksheet that we have before you. But, Ken, um, it seems to me that the behind this passage this long section which he deals with justification and the righteousness of God uh, is there was a problem of boasting in verse 27 Paul says hey then what becomes of our boasting and uh, I can't help but think that that he's being a little tongue in cheek here because there, the, there's a problem of boasting anyway. In Second Corinthians, Paul spends a whole bunch of time, tongue in cheek, talking about his own boasting, <laughs> about having been a Jew of Jews and all of his credentials, and he's, he, he goes through this whole thing in which he's yeah. boasting, but he's really doing a bit of tongue in cheek in Second Corinthians. That's but true. but it seems that there was a problem here of boasting. And Ken, I'm wondering if, if, if I could post that to you as a, a start off as a general overview of this whole passage. What was the problem of their boasting and what were they boasting about? Well, we can only uh, reconstruct this uh, historically as, as best we can infer from the text uh, of the scripture and other places. But here's what I would say is a reasonable reconstruction. And that is that in the church in Rome, you had both Gentile and Jew. Now, let's assume that the church in Rome was started, you might say, de facto, in fact, by some Jews that came back from the day of Pentecost, went back to Rome and started meeting together, believing in Jesus. They had been baptized in Jerusalem. They were back in Rome. <clears throat> and then they started attracting their Gentile neighbors into the church. And it's interesting that in the last, oh, I don't know, 20, 25 years, there's been a big debate among New Testament scholars about, it's called the Romans debate, it simply means that why would Paul even write about the Jews to a Gentile audience? And of course, that's solved by the simple supposition that there were Jews in the church in, in Rome. Now, <clears throat> it's also important to realize, however, that those believers that were in the church at Rome didn't actually found the church officially. That took Peter and Paul to come to Rome to actually give it an apostolic foundation. And that's why Clement of Rome, that's why um, in the late first century, why Irenaeus in the late second century talk about the church of Rome as being founded on the apostles Peter and Paul. Because the church needed an apostolic foundation. It'd be much like today if, let's say, some believer moves from uh, the main city, let's say in, oh, I don't know, Nigeria, goes into the bush and starts meeting and praying with people, and they start a congregation there, but there's no priest, right? Well, it would be started as a Catholic congregation, but it would still need an official founding. Yeah. So well, that's the problem. I was just to, to put a little add into that, I was reading through uh, Densingers one day, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, for the audience, Densingers is a a famous book that yes. selects and collects from all the historic writings of the church chronologically, right, Ken? Right. And I happen to notice that somewhere in the 12th century, I, I can't remember the name of the pope, of course, but the pope had written a, a decree to the Christians up in Norwegia oh. warning them that baptism in beer was not valid. <laughs> Somehow I already knew that. <laughs> yeah. So so the point is you had some Christians, however, they got way up into Norwegia. And uh, I mean, God bless them. They were up there spreading the faith, but they were apart from leadership. 
And so they were taking it upon themselves to, uh, what's the word, when you take the gospel into a culture. So they were enculturating the gospel for the Norwegians way up there north, (laughs) and they they couldn't, all the water must have been frozen, and so they were using (laughs) beer to baptize. So, I mean, this is kind of what Paul's writing in Romans, he's doing some correction. That's true. Of the uh, of the Christians in Rome. Well, and and so what if we assume then that the church in Rome consisted of Jew and Gentile, then all of these exhortations to the Jews make perfect sense. And of course, they they could boast, as verse twenty seven says, they could very easily boast. But the point that Paul's getting to here is that's so beautiful is that in the Church of Jesus Christ, that church that was called one Holy Catholic and Apostolic in ancient times. That in that church, we're all on the same level. This is important to realize today. And whether one is a cardinal, a bishop, a pope, they of the that office doesn't give them any more hope of heaven than it does for you or me, Marcus, or even for the worst of sinners in the church, whoever that may be. I think it's me, but uh, maybe <laughs> somebody else might think it's them. Uh, <clears throat> because what it depends upon is the grace of God and how much that grace has filled our lives. That's why Paul says in verse 27, <clears throat> he's implicitly saying, if it were based upon works of the law, you could boast, but it's not. It's based upon the law or principle of faith. He begins this section with that right there. If you go way back then to verse 9, you know, he's picking up this is following from last week's passage. What then, given what we looked at last week, um, are we Jews any better off? So there's he's he's alluding to this boasting, and yeah. you know I, again as last week we were inserting the word Christian for the word Jew. I can't help but bring this two thousand years later and ask you know amongst Christians, Catholics, non-Catholics. You know sometimes we get into boasting. We get a bit arrogant and we're missing the point of our faith. Uh, yeah, exactly. And because yeah. the. I mean, the underlying point of this whole passage is, excuse me, it was Jesus. It wasn't you. It wasn't me. It was <laughs> Jesus. True. Any justification we have, any experience of the righteousness of God, any forgiveness of sins, anything was done. It's not because we happen to obey some work of the law. It's because of grace. That's the point of this. So he begins, what then? Are we Jews any better off? And he yeah. says, no, not at all. And then he gets into this section, Ken, that uh, gets into some theology that has divided Christians, especially over the last 500 years. But I know Augustine was dealing this also with the Pelagians and others, where he says, No, not at all, for I have already charged that all men, both Jews and Greeks, are under the power of sin. And he'll come to this whole issue about you know, verse 23, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, all, Jew and Greek. Mm-hmm. Um, so what about this issue, which he really deals with in verses 10 through 18? He makes this comment, all have sinned, all are under the power of sin. And then from verse 10 through 19, he gives a long list of quotes from the Psalms. Mm-hmm. So can talk about how Paul uses the Old Testament to back up his claim that everybody, Jew or Greek, are under the power of sin. Yeah, it's it just to perhaps as one little point that our listeners may want to know. Literally in the Greek, it it doesn't say that uh, for verse nine, uh, it doesn't say that all men, both Jews and Greeks, are under the power of sin. It just says that they're under sin. And the uh, the translators of the RSV there have interpreted as the power of sin, which also, by the way, I was reading in this in Italian this morning, and uh, it uses the word dominio del peccato, which means under the uh, dominion of, wow, of sin. Okay. It might mean the judgment of sin as well, though. In other words, we're all under sin's judgment. And what is that judgment? Well, that's what he goes on to prove from all those quotations, that long list of quotations. Now, you know, in modern times, we tend to be a little bit more selective. But what Paul is doing is, and it might say adding insult to injury, he's trying to show the extensive, extensively how God has has shown that 
people are not seeking after God. You remember he says, for example, in verse 11, there's, there's no one that comprehends. There's no one who understands. There's not even anyone who's seeking God. Now, he's quoting from the Psalms, and he's quoting about Jews, right, in the Old Testament. In other words, what he's saying is, Jews, look, our own history is a history of people who knew God, who were circumcised and in the covenant people of God, but even we weren't seeking God. So how can we claim superiority over the Gentiles? Now, what he's saying here is that even with all of the grace that is given, it is completely possible for human beings to completely turn away from God. Now, it's interesting here, isn't it, that um, in this particular quotations, um, you and I both, Marcus, were former Calvinists, and we believed in total depravity. And we, we would have cited these texts as evidence, as proof text to say, you see how all, you know, have are totally depraved. And what but what this text means is that he's quoting from this about Jews who are covenant people. What it really proves is that we do have a free will, even as baptized Christians, and we can turn away from God at any moment. Ken will pick up that after the break because in case anyone's looking, you might want, if you're looking at Psalm 14, verses 1 through 3, that's where Paul quotes from. But to really get the context, you've got to remember that in Paul's mind, he was also referring to verse 5 of Psalm 14. And we'll look at that when we come back after the great. You're listening to Deep in Scripture with Dr. Kenneth Howell and Marcus Brown. Hello, I'm Marcus Grodi, the host of this program, and I'd like to tell you about my newest book, What Must I Do to Be Saved? A growing number of Christians today believe that all that is necessary for salvation is an individual's faith in Jesus. Churches everywhere proclaim this Jesus and me theology based upon a simple interpretation of John 3.16. They diminish the need for rituals, sacraments, creeds, or even membership in any particular church. But is this true? In this book, I examine how salvation has always come by being a faithful individual in the family of God, the church. For information, please go to chresources.com or call 740-450-1175. Thank you. Don't forget to watch the Journey Home program with Marcus Grodi on EWTN. Each week, Marcus meets new guests who have journeyed to the Catholic faith from many backgrounds. Be challenged and encouraged as they witness to how their love for the truth of Jesus Christ has brought them into full communion with the Catholic Church. That's the Journey Home program on EWTN, live on Monday evenings at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Deep in Scripture is brought to you by the Coming Home Network International. We are a network of inquirers, converts, as well as lifelong Catholics helping one another grow closer to Jesus Christ. On our website, you'll find conversion stories, articles, and videos, as well as information about becoming a member and receiving our CH newsletter. Visit chnetwork.org or connect with us on Facebook or Twitter. Welcome back to Deep in Scripture. That break went very quickly. Uh, we hope you are following us along in this program. We're going to pick up where we left off just a moment ago in Romans chapter 3, verse... We're looking at the, the proof text that Paul uh, has in verses 10 through 18 to back up the idea that everyone, all men, Jews or Greeks, are under the power of sin, under authority of sin, or under sin, as you pointed out, Ken. But what I want to also emphasize, is, as you were getting to, Ken, before the break, is that especially those that Christians who are uh, deeply wedded to the idea of sola scriptura have been influenced by the seeming example of St. Paul here to proof text theology. 
In mm. other words, uh, you have an idea that you want to promote. And so you find a text here and you find a text there and you bring them together to back up your idea. Mm -hmm. And I remember writing an article one time about how you could take any three verses and start a new religion tomorrow. <laughs> True. You know, and we see this happening all the time. We see that, for example, with groups that take the quote from Isaiah, by his stripes you are healed. And then they'll take another quote, the quote from Luke, where he talks about, you know, he gives pressed down, overflowing. And then we take another verse where Jesus says, whatever you ask in my name, I will give to you. And they put those three verses together and come up with the health and wealth gospel that if you believe in Jesus, he'll give you everything. You'll be healed. But what they do is they ignore the contexts from which those verses are taken. And part of it is because we today admittedly, maybe you people listening are better than, than me, but we don't memorize very well anymore. We no, may we memorize a text like the verse in verse 23 where Paul says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We may, we may memorize that little text, but we're not very good at memorizing all the verses around it. And we forget the fact that, Ken, that was the tradition of the Jewish people. That when Jesus spoke from the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He wasn't merely proof texting one little verse to express his depression on the cross. He was proclaiming the messianic meaning of Psalm 22 by just that one quote. And that that is essentially what Paul is doing here in each of these quotes. These are tips of icebergs that deal with a bigger theology that are referenced in those Psalms. Well, that's exactly right. You know, at the end of the day, I was driving down the street here in my hometown of Champaign, Illinois, and I saw there was a, on the picture, there was a picture of Jackie Robinson. You remember Jackie oh, Robinson? Yes. The great uh, first black um, baseball player in the big leagues. And uh, then the, and the words that were accompanying this picture of him were, here's to you, Mr. Robinson, right? <laughs> and now... You'd have to be old enough to remember that song by Simon and Garfunkel, Here's to You, Mrs. Robinson, to get the nuance of what. But you see, so it's one little phrase, but what it does is it evokes, yes. right? It evokes a whole meaning for people. And that's what you're saying. That's what Jesus was doing on the cross. When he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He's evoking Psalm 22, the whole thing, as a meaning. And that's what Paul is doing here as well. Yeah, for example, Psalm 14, and Ken, you're the, you're the Greek scholar here, and maybe you can just point it out, but when he begins with Psalm 14, verses 1 through 3, none is righteous, no, not one, not one understands, no one seeks for God, all have turned aside, together they have gone wrong, no one does wrong, good, not even one. Now, when I was a Calvinist, I took those words, as John Calvin did, as well as Luther, to imply the total depravity of every single being, every single person. But the context of Psalm 14 doesn't carry that out precisely because if you go back to Psalm 14, after the psalmist has said this, in verse 15, excuse me, verse 5, the psalmist says, There they shall be in great terror, for God is with the generation of the righteous. So in other words, in the psalm, he's recognizing really the more overall picture of the psalms is that there are two ways. There are those that turn from God and who are lost, and there are the righteous who turn to God and by grace are saved. And that was the, the common message throughout the psalms. Well, and this is what implied back with our question from our listener before with verse 29 of, the, of chapter 2, the fact that the Gentile could do inwardly the law and, and in a sense, be, find acceptance from God, be justified, become, as it were, a Jew inwardly, implies that even those that are outside the uh, boundaries of the covenant people, nevertheless, could find salvation because they have inwardly uh, obeyed the law. They've, uh, they've inwardly embraced the grace that was given to them. We don't want to downplay the fact that though every single one of us has sinned, we're affected by that authority oh, yes. or power of sin that falls there. 
if we turn in, on our knees and we ask God forgiveness and his grace, he will empower us, but doesn't magically immediately make us different people. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the, I think one of the biggest surprises of anyone who's been baptized is that when you come up out of the water, you recognize to what extent you're still the same person. I mean, you, you've been changed, mm-hmm. uh, and that's where we're going to get into the justification, but, but still, uh, we've been changed, but we have to act according to that. After, after all those verses of, of uh, uh, his text that give a foundation for his recognition that not just the Greeks, but everyone, Jew and Greeks, uh, are under the power of sin. He goes into verse 19, in which he says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped. And the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human being will be justified in his sight by works of the law, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. So this gets us into the topic of justified, justification. And can to really interpret this whole passage, we, we really need to look at what is, what is meant by the word justified. Because can you, as I, as Calvinists, had a different understanding for the word justification and what it did than the Methodists do when they understand justification or maybe the Baptists or the Calvinists or maybe those who come from a more holiness background. Yeah. Well, within the great, uh, you might say, magisterial reformers, Calvin, Luther, Zwingli, Latimer, these uh, so-called magisterial reformers, They understood justification to be a declaration of God's uh, acceptance, his forgiveness of sin. And they did not understand that to include the sanctifying renewal of the heart. And this is why in the Council of Trent, which is being reiterated by the Catholic Catechism, it says that the justification is not only the remission of sins, but it's the sanctification and rule, renewal of the interior man. And that's really, that division still exists today. Sadly, after almost 500 years, there's still are those who believe that justification is a declaration of God's, uh, of God's forgiveness rather than a renewal of the inner man. And I think that leads us really to verse 23, because how you translate verse 23 makes a difference. Um, He says, in the translation that we have here, which is the RSV, the Revised Standard Version, it usually translates it, we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, right? Now, I remember learning that as a young person. uh, All sinned and come short of the glory of God. The idea of coming short of the glory of God seemed to imply there was this standard, right? God has this righteous standard, and you have fallen short of that. You've not made the grade. Therefore, Jesus Christ made the grade for you. He declares you righteous, and therefore now you have the grade through Jesus Christ. Well, there's one truth to that, and that is, yes, it does come through Jesus Christ. But I'm afraid that the translation might be a little bit off And, you know, it's funny that I I read this even in Greek for many years and still didn't see it because what I was doing is I was reading my English meaning, fall short of the glory of God, into the Greek. Then one day it struck me, the Greek word hustereo also means not fall short of something, but to be deprived of something. So let me retranslate it. We all have sinned and are deprived of the glory of God. Now, is there a difference in meaning to fall short of the glory of God and to be deprived of the of the glory of God? I think there is. One is consistent with the Protestant idea that one is falls short of the standard. The other is deprived of the glory of God means that our inner soul is deprived of, of God's presence through sin. And this is what the church means by mortal sin is that we're deprived of the presence of God. Um, And being deprived of the glory of God is that Adam was given, Adam and Eve were given this glory of God in their souls in the beginning, through the fall, 
They lost that in their souls. And that's what salvation is. Yes, we agree with our Protestant friends. It comes through Jesus Christ alone. But he gives it as a renewal of the soul, a sanctification of the soul, not just a legal declaration. If we take that and then let's say we look at um, what he then is uh, implying as a answer to that, we see in verse 22, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Verse 24, they are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as the expiation by his blood to be received by faith. Uh, If we look down at verse 28, for we hold that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. So all of this is kind of saying the same thing, Ken, but it Mm -hmm. has to do with we've been deprived of this this glory of God. We were created Mm -hmm. in his image, but because of our sin, as mortal sin, we are then deprived of this glory. And this glory is restored not because we have earned it by doing a list of works of the law, and therefore God God is obligated to give us payment for what we have done. It's not that. Nor is it the other extreme, which is faith alone, which is if if I believe that Jesus is indeed who he claimed to be, If I believe that, have a mental assent and accept that what he did, if I've done that, then I've been given this gift, regardless Mm -hmm. of how I live my life. Mm -hmm. That's the other extreme, which is the ultimate Mm -hmm. faith alone example, is that it's really a surrender of all that we are to Jesus, Mm -hmm. accepting who he is, what he has done, but then surrendering our whole life and our actions to be obedient to him. And as a result of that, we are setting ourselves aside, we're setting our boasting aside, and we receive that grace through, and that means accepting the church, accepting the sacraments, and therefore we are changed by the act of this uh, work of God in these sacraments to change us, to make us, we then re-receive the glory of God that we have been deprived through our Mm -hmm. mortal actions. Well, and that's what he means, I think, by the manifestation of God's righteousness. In other words, how do we know what kind of what God is like? Well, Paul is telling us here that we know that God is righteous by the way that he has dealt with us. The way that he's dealt with us is not to say, oh, okay, you're okay, you know, I'm okay, you're okay. Uh, in other words, uh, God has not said to us, "Yeah, you you did a few bad things, but I'm gonna I'm gonna overlook it at this point." What He says <clears throat> is that God has sent Jesus Christ in verse 25 as the propitiation or expiation. It says in the RSV translation, He He set forth Jesus Christ as an expiation by His blood. Now, the Greek word behind expiation, or in some versions propitiation is the Greek word hilosterion. And it's the exact word that's used in the Septuagint of the Old Testament to mean the mercy seat. In other words, on the Ark of the Covenant that was inside the Holy of Holies, the top of it was called the hilosterion. It meant the place of mercy and forgiveness. Jesus Christ is that place of mercy and forgiveness. Why? Because that's where he received the judgment for our sins. And, and so he was, in a sense, our substitute. And he was the Lamb of God who was sacrificed for us. That's what allowed us to be forgiven. So God wasn't just overlooking our sin. He judged our sin, but he judged it in Jesus Christ. John refers to this in his first letter beginning yes, he in, does. in yes. chapter 2, when he writes, My little children, I am writing this to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the expiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of 
of the whole world. I mean, this is a very powerful passage in First John, it Ken, because yeah. it implies a couple things. You know, from our Calvinist perspective, Ken, we had ex- ex- understood this to mean, these passages in Romans to mean, that we are totally depraved and fall short of the glory of God and that there is nothing we can do, because we interpreted works of the law to mean anything we did. There's That's nothing true. we can do whatsoever, not only to please yeah. God, but to break from sin. Right. In other words, right. we can't not not sin. Right, uh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Where John yeah. implies in his letter that he is writing so that we may not sin that by grace we can grow to the point where we can resist committing sin that separates us from God. And if we fail, and I believe that John was writing uh, from the position of being uh, quite a ways along in the journey of grace, uh, as St. Teresa would write, maybe from the sixth or seventh castle. You know, he's at that level of... (laughs) Of, yeah. uh, of growing in grace uh, that a lot of us, uh, me included, me particularly, have a long way to go. But he's in a position where he has grown by grace to be great, greatly resistant from sin. But he says, if we fail, we have this advocate, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the expiation for our sin, not for ours. But everyone in the world has mm. been expiated, right. which we had a problem with as Calvinists. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. No, it's 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 a, a, a very important point because what Paul is pointing back to is, as you pointed out earlier about the passion and death of Christ, is that in every everything really depends upon Christ. It depends upon who he is. Is he the Son of God? Is he God in the flesh? And it depends upon our relationship to him. It doesn't matter how good people we are. It's not good enough to get to heaven. It's not good enough to be with God if it isn't through Jesus Christ. So when people, some people on the one hand, you know, uh, say uh, that the Catholic Church is too focused on Mary or it's too focused on the Pope or it's too focused upon these rituals and so forth. But what they don't understand is that the Pope, Mary, all these things are all, you might say, pointers back to the very center, Jesus Christ. That's why when you walk into a Catholic church, you should see a cross with a body on it, the body of the suffering Jesus, because it's in the cross that is our glory. I just about quoted from an old Protestant hymn I learned as a child, in the cross I glory. (laughs) That's, that's my, that's my, and that's central to our Catholic faith. However, it's also important to realize that that being the case, uh, the church also says we have to be not just by faith in the sense of mental ascent. We have to be vitally connected. There has to be a life flow between Jesus Christ and us. Objectively, that comes with the sacraments, but then we place our faith and act upon that, and we grow in that faith with God. I think one other thing that is a part of my presumption when I read these passages that I brought with me from my Calvinist back, my Lutheran, I was originally Lutheran, then Calvinist, Uh, But both of them share in the idea that when we say the word justify, we're immediately thinking about, therefore, being saved. That that the idea of being justified implies, it takes us immediately to the end of our life. And that now that I've been justified, I am now saved, end of my life saved into eternity. Once yeah. saved, always saved. That was part of the five points of Calvinism. Yeah. But, but the context that it's really important to recognize is that that's not the context of, which, of what Paul is speaking about, either here in Romans or in Ephesians chapter 2 when he's dealing with the same issue, or even what John was dealing with. It, it, he's talking about now, where these Jewish and Gentile Christians now sit that by their faith in Jesus Christ, that grace changed their heart and mind and then saved them and pulled them out of where they were before as Jews trying to earn their way with God by their works of the law or Gentile uh, pagans Mm -hmm. 
trying to be right with their understanding of God through their sacrifices at their pagan um, uh, idols, that, that what has happened is that by their faith in Christ, that they have been now, as I'll read for the Catechism says, that through the power of the Holy Spirit, we take part in Christ's passions by dying to sin and in his resurrection by being born to a new life, and we are members of his body, which is the church, branches grafted onto the vine, which is himself. So through, through baptism and the graces of that, we are saved now. But that means we still have to live that out for the rest of our life. It's opened up the door for salvation, but doesn't guarantee that we're not going to turn, as John talks about in 1 John, and turn back to sin. Well, and this is exactly what I was pointing out about verse 23 when it says that we're deprived of the glory of God. Through God's grace in the sacraments, we now receive, and we, um, we, we, we receive that grace, that glory, that's in God. And it starts filling our hearts. But that's a lifelong process. And one of the interesting things is you listen to some of these health and wealth preachers and you listen to people. There was just another vi- there was just another uh, video the other day of Victoria Osteen, Joel Osteen's wife talking about. And it was incredibly uh, self-centered. It just, and, I, and I don't mean to criticize her as a person, but it's the conception that's out there that God exists for me or that Religion is all about me. And the the message of Christ is deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. And through that, you then receive more glory from God, more grace from God. And as you're saying, Marcus, you grow to that point of perfection at the end of life. You're not there yet, but you're, but you're moving toward that by this continual infusion of grace that God gives. Reminds me of the writings of a, a great French Jesuit named Father Grow, G R O U, wrote 200 oh, yes. years ago. He was one of those that was driven out of France during the Revolution. And in one of his books called Marks of Marks of Discipleship or Marks of Perfection, he, he he addresses the problem of the French Protestants at the time. They were focusing all on their individual salvation. You know, what am I going to do to be saved? Mm-hmm. And, you know, it seemed like their whole faith was about themselves. And, and Father Gro points out that the danger of focusing everything on our salvation is that it becomes very self-focused. Yeah, and he right. said there's three things that are important. Number one, giving glory to God. Mm-hmm. Uh, number two, loving your neighbor. Number three, growing in holiness. And essentially he said, you leave salvation up to God. Yeah, you focus on giving glory to God giving love to your neighbor, growing in holiness. And as we close this section, you know, this issue of boasting. No, it's not about boasting, not about works. Uh, No, but the principle of faith, for we hold that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. And so, I mean, Ken, why don't you summarize, what does he mean then by that phrase, a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law, given what we've discussed? Well, what what it means is that, is what he said earlier, that is that this process of being justified comes through the sacrificial death of Christ and the resurrection, which he said back in verse 25. He says in verse 24 that this is given to us freely as a gift through the redemption. It's not given to us because of something we did or something we merited. But, and this is an important point, Marcus, <laughs> that the merits that the Catholic, Catholic theology and Catholic Church speak of are merits that are Jesus Christ's merits. We have no merits except what Jesus Christ gives us. But we give them by having faith in him, by living a a life of obedience to him. Yeah, our ability to believe comes from grace. And our ability to continue in faith comes from grace. So it's all about grace. But we still have to respond to that. And that's what faith is. That's what faith is. It's an acting on the grace we've been given. And that ability comes from him. So again, it all, instead of boasting, it leads us back back to the three things that Augustine said were the most important things. Humility, humility, humility. (laughs) Thank you, Ken. Thank you. And thank you, all of you, for joining us. Please connect with us on the website. We'd love to hear your thoughts about this program. God bless. See you next week.